how long have you worked with with the Colonel Jerry Coleman? Uh, be this is my thirty third year, and the only year we didn't work together was when he was the manager, and that's how I got my job because he went on the field. Stupid move. Got a giant hole in his stomach. <laughs> Ulcer operation after the season. Back to the booth, and then we started working together in '81 when he came back. If there's anybody that has to write a book on Jerry Coleman, it's you. But for right now, since they're going to honor your longtime partner tomorrow with a statue, can you possibly tell me one or two favorite moments from working with Jerry? Wow. Just to cut it down to 200 would be tough. But uh, in Cleveland, in Cleveland, where you're right above, like, like, like here, with people coming right below us at the press level, and they had that guy, the drummer, the crazy drummer, who had been involved in a court case, where he was annoying everybody, and they kicked him out, and he went to court, and the judge said, okay, you have to let him in, but he has to buy a separate ticket for his drum. So that's why he was able to come back, and he's there. So we're there in early for the first time, and, and here comes the just bang, 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 right below us, and Jerry says on the air, what is that racket? And I said, don't you remember, Jerry? That's the guy, the drummer guy. I forget his name. They kicked him out, but he bought a ticket, and now he brings the ticket for his drum, and they can't get rid of him, so he bangs all the time. So that ended it, and then about 20 minutes later, or two innings later, the guy is right below us again, just banging and banging. And Jerry says, do you believe that guy? I said, Jerry, he's just banging a drum. <laughs> he says on the air, well, let him go home and bang someone else. <laughs> now we go to the commercial, and I say to him, do you know what you said? What? I, I, this, I said, that, no, no, he said, I said, let him go home and bang something else. I said, Jer. So we had him play it at the studio in his headset during the commercials, and there it was, go home and bang someone else. And he just, well, yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> Better, I thought, was at Wrigley Field, before they had the new press box, which is up higher, it used to be the really low one, and fans could look in all the time, you had no privacy whatsoever. And he was working uh, with Dave Campbell instead of me on that game. And Dave got sick and had to leave and could not come back to the booth. So Jerry worked himself, I think it was the 8th, 9th, no, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And the bathroom then was way down in Wrigley. You couldn't go to a commercial, run down to the bathroom, and possibly come back. So here it's like the 13th or 14th inning. He's all alone. And he's, he's just dying. He's just dying. So he finally sees there's a garbage can. He's gonna grab the garbage can, and he thinks this is a perfect time because they're having an intentional pass, intentional walk. Manny Trio of the Cubs is on second. Benito Santiago is the catcher. So Jerry figures, what could happen? What could possibly happen during an intentional walk? So he grabs the garbage pail, can, and sticks it between his legs and puts his head down because aim is very important here, of course. <laughs> So, in the middle of this, he's trying to, you know, make sure nobody can look in from the stands, and he's taking care of his business. All of a sudden, Benito Santiago, unlike anyone ever in history, tries to pick off Manny Trio at second during an intentional walk. So, Jerry's not safe after all. He's looking down. He has no idea. He throws the ball, and the ball goes into center field. Trio is running around third to score. Now, Jerry hears this huge roar, and he looks up, and it's and the ball's in center field, and Trio's rounding third, and I think the game's over. <laughs> he had no idea what happened because he was looking down, taking care of his business because he couldn't get to the bathroom in extra innings, and this guy tries to pick somebody off in, in, in an intentional ball. You can't pop, you can't top that. You can't, there's many, but you can't top that. I think of the San Diego Padres, I think Tony Gwynn. I think of the man that brought us Padres baseball, I think of Jerry Coleman. What is your earliest recollection of Jerry? Uh, earliest recollection is uh, this gentlemanly man who saw something in me that uh, he thought from time to time he could give me a little tidbit that was going to help me become a better player. and. And I tell Jerry this all the time. You think I don't? I didn't listen to you, but I listened to everything that you told me. And you were right. You know, he Jerry is the most humble person I think I've ever met. And he never likes talking about himself. Loves talking about other people. And and I I really mean this sincerely. He really helped me at a time in my career where I really needed it. I needed to be able to bounce stuff off somebody to kind of figure out if I was doing things the right way or not and 
you know, Jerry's thing was always, he said, hey, just go out, do the best you can, be humble about it. And he was right. But, you know, when I think of Padre Baseball, he's, that's who I think of. I think of Jerry because he's seen it all. He's seen, he's seen everything. He's actually been on the field trying to control everything. And, uh, and, uh, and unfortunately for me, I came right after that. Uh, but I think the things that he learned when he was down there, no question, helped me get to where I was trying to go. Would it surprise you if, if I told you he said that you were his favorite player of all time to cover? Of all the characters and the personalities that have come through, come through the San Diego Padres, you were his absolute favorite. I, 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 I honestly believe that because <laughs> I, one of the funniest Jerry Coleman stories, and, and if you ask him about it, he'll tell you. Okay. Night, I forget what year it was. I was I was leading the league in hitting, and I hurt my knee. And uh, we were sitting in the dugout one day, and I, I Jerry was asking me how you doing. I said, oh, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it. And he said, You know what? You you played as hard as you can play. You're not playing like you were playing before. You should go ahead and have knee surgery. And I said, ah, I, I would I wouldn't feel comfortable winning that way. I'd rather go out on the field anyway. I think Terry Filmson won the batting title that year. Hal Morris finished second. I finished third. And to this day, he said, you should have nine batting titles. He says, there's only two people in the world who know that. Your dad and I. He said, your dad and I talked about it. You should have nine, but we'll we'll leave it at eight and, and go on about our business. But to this day, he still rags me about that. I, he said, you should have won nine. But uh, uh, honestly, he – but that's Jerry, you know, and, and, and again – I can see why I was might be his favorite because I, I would ask him a lot of questions. I would go to him and just ask him. And uh, when my son was growing up, when he was coming out here to the ballpark with me, he swore up and down he should play second base. And I told him, I said, and he started out playing second base. And then we started shagging balls together in the outfield, and he wanted to become an outfielder. And Jerry would tell me all the time, he should be a second baseman, he should be a second baseman. And, uh, uh, and he probably should have been a second baseman, but uh, but that again, that's just Jerry. He'll throw his two cents in, and if you trust him and believe in him, hey, it'll work. And if it doesn't, if you don't, then he he's not going to hold it against you. He's just going to yeah, he's just going to let you go on about your way. But uh, with me, I think he saw something in me that he thought he could cultivate. And I saw something in Jerry that I thought I could, you know, I could get information and get better, and and it worked out okay. So you're saying in so many ways that with Jerry Coleman, he was able to rag on you for, for certain things, and you know what? And it, and it worked out for both of you. You guys had a relationship where it was yeah, okay. I do. And uh, and again, he's. Uh, I'm glad he's having today because uh, I think he really has deserved it. Now, if you ask him, he's not gonna. He's not gonna. He's not gonna even think that. But I think deep down inside, where Jerry really lives, I think he's kind of looking forward to today. And uh, and I hope today he has a great day. I I saw him yesterday, and I was yelling. We sang happy birthday to him as he walked into the lunchroom yesterday. And for 88, he looks great. He's an amazing person, and, and I wish people had a chance to really sit down and talk to him like I get the chance to do. And even today at his lunch, he's joking around <laughs> and he deflecting, deflecting stuff about him and talking about other things. And uh, uh, But, yeah, he's been a great, great friend. Last thing, with all your time with him, whether it's in the broadcast booth, on the field, um, in the press box, or on, on the team airplane, is there a signature Jerry Coleman moment that comes to mind? Uh, there are, but I can't, can't get into it. I can't, you know, because Jerry's sneaky. See, Jerry is... Uh, the one story I'll tell is that we're on a we're going somewhere I forget where we're on the plane, and Jerry's mo would be we'd get on the plane we're leaving San Diego he would get on the plane and about a half an hour into our plane ride he'd be in his chair sleeping straight up and down not leaning back just straight up and down, and early in my career I would ask him questions but later on I would mess with him I would go up go past his row and tell him Jerry sit back you're gonna hurt your you're gonna hurt yourself and uh, and I walked to the front he usually sat in the front row by himself he had all three seats and I walked up to him and I said Jerry you know what? for years I've been coming here telling you you need to sit back you know what today I'm not gonna say anything I'm just just gonna come up and say hello how you doing good to see you I'll talk to you later and he looked at me with that 
typical Jerry Coleman look, and he says, you know what, Tony? You don't think, you didn't think I liked you coming up here and telling me to sit back. <laughs> one, one of the things that always made my day was seeing you get up out of your seat, come all the way to the front, say hello, ask me questions. And you know what? I just really like the conversations that we've had. And that that's a true story. That was, that's, that's typical Jerry Coleman. Just when you think that you're about ready to hit that last nerve, he turns it right around and puts it back, you know, in your face. And that's... He's been that way since I've known. I mean, like I said, I've been here in this organization, around this organization since 1981. He's always been there, whether it was on the baseball field, whether it's at San Diego State when I got sick and was in the hospital, who comes to see me, Jerry Coleman. Uh, I just want to be there for him when he has his days. Today's his day. So here I am. I'm going to be here. And I hope later on when his ceremony starts, hopefully I can get in the booth and raise and way to star i think that would i think that would mean a lot thank you very much tony right, thank you, you.